أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي أنا لهذا وما أنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدان الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين النذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين I begin in Allah's name the beneficent the merciful and I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us this existence and giving us the opportunity to be his representatives on earth and that he has created us from pure souls and given us direction and hope with which to reach very high levels of existence in the hereafter in the state of eternity I bid you all, my respected brothers and sisters in Islam, and of course our equals in humanity, the rest of the human race, Ramadan Kareem, Ramadan Mubarak. It is the month of blessing. Allah says, Shahru Ramadan, Alladhi unzila fihi al Quran, Hudan lin nas, wa bayinat min al Huda wal Furqan. This month of Ramadan, it is a blessed month. It is known as Shahru Allah. It is the month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we know, Shaban is the month of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And since Imam Mahdi ajallahu ta'ala faraja is the finality of the Prophet himself in the sense of representation in the message, then we find that while the birth of our blessed Imam Mahdi alayhi salam is in Shaban, Shaban is actually the month of the Holy Prophet. And as we know, Rajab, is the month of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. And Allah is merciful in that he prepares us for the great spiritual upliftment by which to reach tranquility in the hearts and enables us to practice how we should live on this earth. Because if we know how to live on this earth, then we will achieve very high stations. But if we are negligent, or reckless and don't pay attention as to why we were created, what our functions are on this earth, then we will miss the great opportunities. So this month of Ramadan, Allah has blessed us that while he takes us from Rajab into Shaban, into Ramadan, that we reach a level of spirituality where the inner conscience, the spiritual self, starts to really understand the meaning of life and understands that all the material entities that surround us are simply a means to this goal. And in this month, Allah says, كُتِبْ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبْ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ We have enjoined upon you fasting as we did on your predecessors so that you may achieve piety. And this piety is the discussion in this thematic series of conversations that I'm going to continue having for the next 25, 30 nights, depending on the, the programs. Uh, and uh, inshallah, for every night, we will delve on how to be this, uh, you know, perfect self. How do we take the self to a level that it was destined to be? But there's nothing more important, I think, while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the tawheed, the tawheed, the oneness of Allah, the, the necessity to everything converged towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From a practical perspective, we must understand ourselves. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba. And this, you know, sentence that the Prophet uttered is very deep, very profound. Man arafa nafsa. There's nafs involved, there's arafa involved, there's uh, rabb involved, your Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet is teaching us that you have to know who you are and the when you understand who you are, you will know your Lord. And in the Quran, Allah says, Ya ladina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahalikum nar. Oh, you believe, take care of yourselves and your family from this impending destruction should we become negligent. And all of this is really on the on the principle of knowing the self. So I think the series are going to be completely delving and indulging in understanding this 
inner self, the me, the I, the nafs, the ruh that's in us, um, the the qalb that really directs us and where our real faith lies. All these aspects need to be discussed. And in order to achieve that discussion, we have to understand the holistic philosophy of Allah first and foremost, and that while we talk about ourselves and while we understand who we are, the best way to reach the destined goal of what we should be and what really is the reality is that we must know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, there is no greater way to expose the realities than through the Asma al Husna, the most chosen names of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Himself in the Quran, and I will discuss that uh, tomorrow as an introduction today. The general sense, as Imam Ali alayhi salam explains, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indescribable. You know, when we say, Allahu la ilaha illa hu in Ayat al Kursi, verse 255 of Surah al Baqarah. Imam Ali alayhi salam says that Allahu is the best description of Allah. Allah is He. Any description we give of Allah uh, is not a proper description. And we need to discuss that. We need to understand the divine presence. We need to understand the principles of Tawheed. We need to understand how Allah functions with us. We need to understand the, um, the manifestations of how Allah describes himself. So to have the understanding of the zat of Allah, what is Allah made up of? What is he? Where is he? These kinds of questions really are impossible. No human being should dare delve into such conversations because the absolute being can never be described. And any method by which we describe in the zat form is going to lead to insanity. But Allah is so merciful that when he creates, he allows and he creates um, expressions. He creates uh, descriptions of himself in the relative world. So when we talk about, you know, Allah nuru samawati wal ard, Allah is Jabbar, Mutakabbir, Quddus, Rahman, Rahim. These are created expressions by Allah for us. So Allah has placed these names, the Asma al Husna, even the name Allah, the God, the one who is most worthy of being loved. These are creations of Allah made for the human race or any sentient being that is created in the human in the in the universe to understand Allah because we are limited. He is limitless. And I think it's very important for us to talk about these realities. Because I'm watching the world among people of faith, the Abrahamic faith, the monotheistic faith. And there's a lot of corruption about Allah, even in the monotheistic faith, such as in the Christian faith. You find that they insist God is one, but they anthropomorphize God. They give him a corporeal function. They give him a sonship. They give him a part of himself that is born, part of himself that dies. They give weakness to Allah. They give attributes that don't belong to Allah. And I feel that the minute we do that, we will not understand what our functions are on earth. And actually, by not understanding our functions on earth, and by not fulfilling the obligations of knowing Allah, we will miss the boat. And we will never reach the high stations that has been destined for us. So when we were created, how were we created? You know, when Allah decreed our creation, when God breathed, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathes that spirit, the ruh, what are these entities? What is it that makes us? What do we need to know about ourselves? Because if we understand ourselves, we will know our Lord. And also, if we understand ourselves and therefore our, and know our Lord, we will become tranquil. We will avoid depression we will avoid feeling of helplessness. Today, socially speaking, psychologically speaking, mentally speaking, biologically speaking, physiologically speaking, the world is in a state of tremendous quandary and chaos. 
in the sense that a lot of people are in a state of depression, state of hopelessness, with the pandemic especially, the uncertainties, the globalization that we live in, the single superpower, or at least the elite groups that are controlling the vast resources on earth. There are people who feel choked and the level of poverty on earth is increasing. There are people who are the extreme rich who are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. That disparity from the middle class is getting wider. And as a result of that, we're finding ourselves to be in a state of trepidation when I travel the world and I listen to people talk, even young generations, you find that they're expressing hopelessness, mental uh, issues. And this has become huge, especially in this year. The conversation online is about mental health. It's about how do we get people to become less stressed? How do we avoid PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? How do we make people more cognizant and have hope and heal so that they can achieve tranquility on this earth and in the hereafter? You find suicide rates are rising. More children kill themselves now than ever in the history of the human race. Sure, our population is at 8 billion people on earth. That's a tremendous amount of population. So if you hear 10,000 people dying, it's not as bad statistically as one would say compared to when there were 4 billion people. True, but one life lost is too much. Nobody can argue that you know one or a billion you know, uh, is a matter of statistical values. No, every life is important because every life was chosen by Allah to be placed on this earth. Every life was shaped and fashioned to be put on this earth for a mission. And our objective is to ensure that we save and protect every life. So this depression ma matter today has increased. Children who are being denied their normal social environments, for example, through online studying, virtual classrooms, it's a disaster. We're finding, especially the younger age children, are feeling more depressed, more neglected. They're feeling themselves left out and their social skills are being challenged and they're finding themselves in a state of anger. I mean, you see some kids even on Zoom, you know, threatening to commit suicide while in class. So why is this happening? Well, because Allah has hardwired us to behave and to indulge and to be in certain environments. And if we're denied those environments, then certain symptoms will show up and there will be lots of issues and problems that we're going to have to face. You're finding, for example, that this particular past school year since the pandemic started with COVID, in the United States, most public schools shut down for a good reason, and that is to protect the health of our children and the families, and rightfully so. But notice what is happening, that these children now, because they're denied their social environments, we as adults are denied having our congregations in prayer, for example, lectures that, that were being held in large audiences, live audiences that was at another level of energy is now going through virtual. And virtual realities that we're experiencing is not the same because there's a disconnection in terms of that feeling of energy. Now at the quantum level, of course, you can feel it, but at the physical level, the general physical level, it's very difficult. And as a result, because schools have been closed for an entire year, uh, research is showing that our children are really suffering in so many different dimensions. And inshallah, we will hopefully recover so that we can repair this. But in the meantime, what can we do to protect ourselves that even if we're placed in solitary confinement, how do we save ourselves? Or you, you know, save yourselves. How? How do we save ourselves? This conversation needs to be taken in a series of, of uh, presentations from Tawheed, the presence of Allah, the will of Allah, to our creation from the light that was created by 
the, the nur, the anwar of the holy prophet and the prophets and the imma that got the, as the source of the distribution of this self that we possess, this that we have, the ruh that we have that causes us to live and all the components that we have, these have all been originated and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in the Quran. He describes how they work. He describes how they will function and he warns us of their impending failures should they be neglected and so on. So I think it's very important for us to discuss this and I'm going to delve deeper starting tomorrow uh, with reference to understanding Tawheed, the purity, and then of course the, the will of Allah and the creations, particularly the Prophet himself, his nur, and uh, how it got brought on earth. And these dimensions are very important because this will make us understand who we are. Now at the same time while we're talking, we will discuss from the Quran because there is no book that can guide us better than the Quran. You know, Allah the unzila fil Quran, hudan lin nas. It's a guide for mankind. And the Quran is, of course, the, the ultimate guide. And there is no book on earth that can guarantee our safety, security, spirituality, direction, tranquility, you name it, than the Quran. There is no scripture on earth that is existent, that is extant, that can guide humanity except the Quran. Well, with due respect to our Christian brethren and you know Jewish brethren and uh, our brethren of other faiths, nothing compares with the Quran. So I think it's very important for us to address it from the Quran, from the Hadith, the Sunnah of the Prophet, of course, the Holy Prophet left us two heavy things. In nitarikun fikum thaqalain leave you two things, very heavy, the Holy Prophet has stated. And these two are the Kitabullah and the Aitrat of Ahlul Bayt. And we need to maintain these two together. They will never separate, even when they meet in the pool of Kawthar. And if we want to save ourselves, we must address it through the Quran. This is the month in which the Quran was revealed. It is the month in which the inspiration, the spiritual Quran was entirely revealed on the night of Qadr into the heart of the Prophet And then it took 23 years to bring it to the human race in a created form of words, verses, chapters. And these verses are composed of muhkamat, decisive and allegorical verses, meaning verses that can be interpreted multiple ways, but the Quran completely is decisive. So it is the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed. It is the month of Ramadan in which Laylatul Qadr and the destiny of mankind is decreed on the nights of Qadr. And all of this as a gift while we're fasting, abstaining from consumption, abstaining from gluttony, abstaining from the normal routines of our 11 months in a year and reversing the engines so that we can now take time to reflect um, and I think that's beautiful. And there is no religion on earth that has a codified system of daily prayers, fasting, pilgrimage, reflections, Quranic reflections on a daily basis, tasbih, dua. There is no religion on earth that has a more sublime, structured, fundamental system placed for humanity, to benefit from than what I just stated. So inshallah in the subsequent nights, and this is just an introduction today, that we will talk about who, what the self is and how do we achieve that level of reaching high stations where on the day of judgment, um, we have achieved that, um, you know, that goal. So for example, if we, if we go into uh, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in Surah Tahrim, uh, verse number 8, Ya ayyuladina amanu, tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha, asa rabbukum an yukaffira ankum 
سيئاتكم ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحت الأنهار يوم لا يجزي الله النبي والذين آمنوا معه نورهم 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 يسعى بين أيديهم وبأيمانهم يقولون ربنا أتمم لنا نورنا واغفر لنا إنك على كل شيء قدير This verse is really a good example that we will touch inshallah Allah says oh you believe turn to Allah with sincere repentance in the hope that your Lord will remove from you your ills and admit you to gardens beneath which rivers flow the day that Allah will not permit to be humiliated the Prophet and those who believe with him meaning that's the day where the good doers will be protected and the evil doers can do nothing like this like they're doing now on earth against the good doers against the Holy Prophet against the Ahl bayt against the, the Imam and Allah says who are they he says their light uh, will be running in front of them before them and by their right hands, meaning Nurhum Yasa Bain Aidim will be a man him. This Nur that will be in front of them and in their right hands, what is this Nur? And what is it that they will be now entering paradise? And what will they say? Yaquluna Rabbana, they will say, Our Lord perfect our light for us. This atmimlana nurana. Perfect for us our light. Atmim lana, nurana, waghfir lana, and protect us. This is deep. And then the final part is, inna ka ala kulli shayin qadir. Indeed, you have authority over everything. You have uh, might over everything. So I think it's very important for us to say, how can we reach that stage where this light will be in front of us and to our right hand and upon our right hand? And what is this light? And what does it mean to say atmim lana nurana, perfect for us? What is this light? What are we talking about? Uh, what component of light do I need to understand now while this world is in a state of trepidation, while many people are suffering from anxiety, mental health is an issue, depression is there, suicide or suicidal ideation is present. Uh, people are feeling helpless, hopeless. It's the worst, by the way, there is no worse position to be existentially than to be in a state of hopelessness, helplessness, feeling of self-destruction. Um, it's the worst state. It's worse than having a disease that's painful. It's the worst state to be in. Because that feeling of total helplessness and abject rejection of anything positive in the mind uh, is a devastating state of existence. And our conversation in this month of Ramadan is for us to talk about how to recognize those problems, how to help those who are in that environment, and how do we take ourselves to such high stations and levels that such thoughts never enter our minds. You find prophets and imams when they were tested with the toughest of trials, like Ibrahim alayhi salam was tested with such difficulty. We tested Ibrahim. And it was so difficult. The trial was so difficult that the average human being would never be able to cross it. And while prophets would turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they would say that we are overwhelmed. Rabbi Anni Maghloobun Fantasir. We're overwhelmed. Help us. When Musa alayhi salam is asking Allah to expand his heart, you know, Rabbi Shahli Sadri, Wayasirli Amri. Make my affairs easy. Wayasirli Amri. And make my speech fluent so that they understand me. This is a human being who is chosen by Allah, endowed with Ruhul Qudus, special spirit, to see the secrets of life, the secrets of the universe, as and when Allah pleases to show them. And they turn to Allah begging that, my Lord, this trial is very difficult. 
But you will notice that no matter how our prophets were tested, even Yusuf salam being tested to such difficult levels that he is now cornered and he is now he is, um, respect is on the line. His destiny is on the line and she wants to ruin it. Zulekha wants to ruin it and he's trapped. First he was thrown in the well by his brothers, taken as a slave, engaged in a lot of um, treachery and now he is blessed with beauty which has now become his entrapment and yet you notice he says Allah. I seek refuge with Allah you notice he doesn't feel helpless he doesn't feel depressed he doesn't feel like he's going to fail no rather he turns to Allah when Yunus alayhi salam is swallowed by the whale right and and Yunus now is in darkness inni kuntu min al-dhalimin i'm in darkness i can just imagine being swallowed first of all just being underwater in the ocean is a harrowing uh, feeling then this massive creature opens its mouth and that water just pushes you right into the belly of this whale and it's tight it's filled with acid and to be in a dark space swallowed by a fish you know you won't survive those expressions are shown in the quran and allah is expressing them for us and he's trying to let us know that these are the kind of states that you will reach you may reach due to the nature of this world due to the nature of trials and tribulations are you going to lose hope? And many people feel that if things are just not perfect, then they start to lose hope. Oh, I'm a bit sick. The doctor said I'm going to have this problem. Oh, that's it. I'm no longer now um, desirous of living on this earth. I no longer want to exist or I want to implode. But you find that Allah shows people like Yusuf, Yunus. What does Allah say? Allah says, lahu. We replied him immediately. Ad'uni, Allah says, Astajib lakum. Ask me, I will reply you. So these are conversations we must have in these 30 nights and understand the holistic vision. When you look at a person who's got confidence, like the Holy Prophet, the Holy Prophet himself, like Imam Ali alayhi salam, Indomitable, unafraid in front of giants, unafraid of death, unafraid of everything that awaits them on this earth of trials and tribulations. And we're watching this, reading this historically. We're wondering how did they achieve such levels of certainty to enable them to be so good in decision making and that they were so focused that Ibrahim being tested to kill his son, to sacrifice his son, he doesn't lose hope. Shaitan is whispering to him, his wife, no, this is a trick, this is a trick, but it doesn't faze him. How can we reach that stage on this earth while we exist, where we achieve such levels of certainty, hope, vision, where we are so dedicated, where we are so giving ourselves at any time. You know when Allah says, Alladina yunfiquna fi sarra waddarra wal kaadhimeen al ghayb. They give charity in good times and in bad times and they hold back their anger. How can we reach that stage? That if my financial situation is not that good, I'm still charitable and I don't complain. And when somebody wants to aggravate me, I don't get aggravated so easily. And when somebody does something wrong to me, I quickly turn to forgive. Hasten to forgiveness. How can I reach that stage? How can I reach that stage where nothing phases me and that I make decisions from childhood about the day I will die, about how I will meet my Lord on Judgment Day, about what I expect in the next world, 
and what I expect in the trajectory of the eternal mercy of Allah. How can I reach that stage? That requires conversation. From the very beginning, to know Allah. To know that Asma al Husna are created entities, just like the words of the Quran are created entities, to enable us to connect with the realities. And then if we understand that, and then we understand that when Allah said, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam, We've honored mankind. إِنَّ اللَّهُ اسْتَفَاكِ وَالْتَحَرَكِ You know when he talks about Maryam, for example, or when he talks about Adam, how they were chosen, how the human race was chosen, and the self that was born, me, many decades ago. Who decreed it? Why was it decreed where, I, where it was decreed? Why am I shaped the way I'm shaped? What is my function on this earth? Why do things happen certain ways? And why don't things happen certain ways? Why is it that some of my prayers are accepted and some of my prayers are not accepted? What is it that I need to do in worship of Allah? What are my expectations? What are God's expectations of me? These require very important conversations because if we can tap into this in these nights, in the month of Ramadan, reflectively with tadabbur, tafakkur, and if we can reach that stage to say, ah, I see this grand scheme of things. I understand Tawheed. So that if anybody alludes to the idea of Trinity ideas that God has, is in three and the Ruhul Qudus is somehow something of Allah or that the, the Ruh that we have is Allah and that, you know, and then somehow Allah is, and then we go into describing Allah physically or that we ascribe wrong events, wrong notions wrong principles to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result, we then ascribe wrong principles to ourselves and our children. And then we go astray, only to find ourselves depressed, unhappy, feeling dissatisfied. While we may possess a lot of wealth, we find ourselves in that state that we're just not finding happiness. For example, identity. If there is one thing that is very important for us, if we are to succeed in this conversation that I'm talking about on this earth, then we must identify ourselves. Who are we? So many people have an identity crisis and so many people have misplaced it that it has led to bigotry, misogyny. When we talk about skin color differentiations, where the darker skin has been institutionalized in a marginal way that to break these terrible systems that have been created. And that there are people today who hold guns, who will go to Congress, who will fight to establish the Jim Crow's of the modern world, where, you know, looking down on a race is their only way of survival. We would say these people have a serious identity crisis serious and it is so misplaced that not only are they in a state of trepidation and they will never be in a state of tranquility but they're causing hell for everyone around them because in order for them to maintain their levels of agitated states they have to agitate everybody with this false idea that if we can just belittle everybody like hitler and look at every other race as a negative and maintain and purify the gene pool that somehow this lighter skin race will now live peacefully. So misplaced, so illogical, so absurd. Where does it stem from? When you see a bigot coming and says, I don't like you, I don't like your race, I don't like your people, or you know, go back to your country. If you examine that person, that person has a serious identity crisis. It is so misplaced that even when they talk, there is no confidence in them. It's just foolishness and noise coming out of them. How do we avoid that? We practice at low levels as Muslims bigotry. Some, unfortunately, at high levels. While we read the Quran, we pray, we fast, we give charity, we go for pilgrimage. Yet we practice bigotry, we practice destruction, we practice 
um, for example, domestic violence, we practice misogyny, where some men come home and consider their gender to be superior to the female or vice versa. People who do this have a serious identity crisis. Is going to be based on that. And we're going to talk about how do we achieve a level of comprehension and to understand what this nafs is made up of, what are its vulnerabilities, and how do we understand that? You know, people say to me, brother, do you believe in astrology, for example? Do you read the horoscope? I said, no, I don't, you know, follow the horoscope. They said, but there's some truth to it. I said, yes, there is. The alignment of the stars and when we were born has an impact on our character. Agreed. I said to them, but if you really want to take advantage of astrology, then why don't you find out the weaknesses in those individual horoscopes and consider those to be yours? And in whatever month you were born, and you know, every 12 horoscopes, there are strengths and weaknesses. So find those weaknesses in your particular sign, focus on them, turn to the Quran and say, I think I have an arrogance problem. I think I, I'm stubborn. I think I am, for example, hard to please. Or I think I am, you know, um, for example, short-tempered. Okay. You recognize them? Then now, save yourself. Who on for circle? Save yourselves from that destruction. How? Say, well, how do I stop being irritated? How do I stop being arrogant? For us to truly eliminate arrogance, the way the Holy Prophet was, and the way his Ahlul Bayt were, we have to understand Tawheed. We have to understand Allah. Imam Hussain in Karbala, while his family is being butchered and annihilated, he is talking to Allah. He is conversing with Allah. He is making deals with Allah. He is seeking solace with Allah. You might think, how? The swords are there. The, the war is there. The physicality of destruction is prevalent. Why is he talking to this omniscient being and why is this, this being stopping this carnage? Why isn't this merciful creator intervening? These are conversations we must have. And why is the Imam not asking Allah at this level to intervene to say, stop this Karbala? No. Imam is praying to Allah to stop the, um, the foolishness on the other side as a dua, in other words, the enemy should know that it's a wrong thing to do. But the Imam is ever so ready to go forward and meet his destiny. And we ask the question, what was this conversation? At what level that when you up the ante, where now there is no return and your destruction is decreed? Why continue conversing with Allah? We cannot do that if we don't know Allah. We will abandon him. We will run away from him. We will, in fact, condemn Allah. But if we understand Allah, and when Allah says, in za'amtum annakum awliyahu lillahi min dunin nas, qul yayu alladhina hadu, O you Jews, you claim to be chosen people of God. In za'amtum annakum awliyahu lillahi min dunin nas. Allah gives a beautiful condition, in kuntum sadiqeen. then have this desire to return to Allah. Here it's not suicide, it's not hopelessness, it's not helplessness. What it actually means is is not suicide, it is in preparation every second to return to Allah. And it could be today or it could be a thousand years from now. Doesn't matter. No, preached 950 years, never complained to Allah, never thought of suicide, never thought of ending his mission, though he suffered so much. But his taman nawal maut was daily. Every prayer, he knew he's talking to God, 
and he knew it's the day of judgment tomorrow, and he knew his return is imminent. That Fatiman al Maut is the kind of reality Imam Hussein had such a grip on. He was that nur that was expressing the reality for us to understand, and that we should just not take the event of and just events and shed tears. All those are important. But if it does not change myself and make me understand myself, man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba, then I have not accomplished. So I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed month of Ramadan that while we are fasting, that oh Allah, increase for us rabbi zidni ilman, fahman, hilman, hikman, rizqan, sabran, innaka anta al wahhab innaka anta as samii dua indeed my lord you are mighty and you listen to our prayers innaka anta as samii dua oh allah infuse in us the tranquility walladhi anzala as sakinata fi qulub al mu'minin infuse in us this tranquility in our hearts so that we have long term vision so that the kind of vision we have is that we're never distracted with these day to day mundane distractions but rather we have tamannal maut that we know that day when malakul maut will meet us we know that day when you will raise us from the dead we know that day when you will question us and we know that day when we will meet the holy prophet at the pool of kawthar and we know that day when our deeds will be placed upon us in our right hands inshallah or that we will become sabiqun as sabiqun the foremost and that we have a destiny we know that day and we know it so well we know it with such clarity that we talk about that day today wa innahu yarawnahu ba'idan wa narahu qareeb they say it is far they say we see it far day of judgment is far death is far uh you know, the grave is far. Ba'idan. Allah says, no. The believers see it near. Allah sees it near. Qariban. Wanarao qariban. How do I reach that level where I see tomorrow today? Can you imagine if we could reach that stage where we can see tomorrow today? Do you realize what level of tranquility we will have? Do you realize what level of certainty we will have? Do you realize how tranquil we will be. I mean, just imagine observing a human being who lives today for tomorrow and knows tomorrow like today and makes decisions today for tomorrow and that their tomorrow is no different than today. SubhanAllah. This is how Imam Ali Islam was. The Najul Balagha, the conversations. It is a man who spoke of tomorrow and that tomorrow was with such clarity that I am his tomorrow. And it is my today. And I listen to him talking about tomorrow, which is my today. But I have that clear understanding of Najul Balagha that when he said it, when he uttered it, for him, it was today. It's deep. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. And let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us that level of wisdom to practice patience and to practice forgiveness and to be cognizant that this world is transient and to be cognizant that this self on judgment day will be questioned. And O oh Allah, guide us. Rabbana la tuzik qulubana ba'adayt hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma innaka anta al-wahhab don't let our hearts, our Lord, do not let it go astray after you've guided it. You are mighty, my Lord. And inshallah, in this blessed month of Ramadan, all of us as a community will indulge in reflective thinking and in proactive relationships and will dodge the bullets and will avoid the pitfalls and will rise to high stations so that we become the best, the best in ourselves, inshallah. May Allah give us a tawfiq, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.